Hello and welcome to this lesson on binding energy, which is part of the nuclear physics topic in AQA A-level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at how you can describe binding energy. So if we've been successful and learnt in today's lesson, we should be able to describe the nuclear processes of releasing energy, calculate the binding energy of a nuclear process, and define and describe the concept of binding energy. So we're going to be looking at the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification for nuclear physics and radioactivity 3.8.1.6 mass and energy so in previous lessons we've co considered the concept of the nucleus in physics so in our work with the nucleus we assume that the nucleus is a perfect sphere and a point charge these two assumptions are incompatible but it's the only way to make the mathematical equations compatible now rutherford estimated the distance of the nuclear radius by looking at the distance at which the alpha particle gets the nucleus before stopping the distance of closest approach. So Rutherford suggested that the kinetic energy of the alpha particle turn into electrical potential energy between the alpha particle and the nucleus. And this is given by the equation R is equal to Q1 Q2 over 4 pi epsilon 0 times by the kinetic energy. Now this value was decided to be an overestimation from the true value because it includes not only the nuclear radius but the separation between the alpha particle and the nucleus itself. Now the true value of the nuclear radius was calculated in the electron scattering experiment where the de Broglie wavelength of an electron is equivalent to the gap size between the nuclei and it caused electrons when fired at nuclei to diffract through the substance. Now the equation for the nuclear radius in this instance was given by the equation 0.61 lambda over sine theta where theta is the minimum angle of diffraction. Now another method to calculate the nuclear radius came from the atomic mass where we said the nuclear radius is equal to r0 a to the power of a third where a is the atomic mass and r0 is the average radius of a nucleon in the nucleus. Now if we assume the nucleus is a perfect sphere then we can calculate its nuclear density and we that the density is equal to u over uh, 3 over 4 pi r0 cubed and all of these values are constant which means that the nuclear density is constant for all nuclei which when we give values is about 3.4 times 10 to the 17 kilograms per meter cubed which is much larger than the atomic density but there's another equation that we can consider when looking at the nucleus in physics and that's an equation that links the exchange of rest mass and potential energy in the universe because mass can be considered a potential store of energy in the universe. So when a particle and its corresponding antiparticle meet, they annihilate with each other. Their rest masses turn into energy in the form of two photons, each with the energy linked to mc squared. Now, on the other way around, a single photon of energy in excess of 2 mc squared can produce a particle and its antiparticle, each of rest mass m in pair production. Now, this is important because Albert Einstein published this idea in the Special Theory of Relativity, where he showed that time moves slower the faster you travel, the mass of an object is dependent on its speed, objects shrink when they travel faster, and the speed of light is the only true constant in the universe. But the, the part of the Special Theory of Relativity we're concerned about in today's lesson is that Einstein used the equation E equals mc squared to show that the rest mass of an object increases when it gains energy, and the rest mass of an object decreases is when it loses energy. There's a fundal, fundamental link between the rest mass of a substance and the energy it possesses. So we could say that the rest mass and the energy were equivalent to each other in an object. So Einstein realized that the mass increase is an equivalent to an energy increase in an object. And he also realized that the mass decrease is equivalent to an energy decrease in the object, which we symbolize with the delta notation in this particular equation. Now this equation, this equation applies to all energy changes in the universe, however it's only truly noticeable on the nuclear scale when we look at events such as gamma emission and nuclear fission. So the effect of this energy and mass interchanging must always be considered in the microscopic world of the nucleus and in nuclear decays. So in all nuclear decays you've got to be able to calculate the mass change in a nucleus from a decay or the energy given out in a decay. Because if the law 
law, if we have the law of energy mass conservation, we would say that energy mass before is equal to energy mass after. So in all nuclear decays, you're going to have to think about what happens when you go from your unstable nucleus to your stable nucleus. So you tend to find that your unstable nucleus has a higher mass than your more stable nucleus. So this mass loss is lost as decay energy in the process, which we can also call the mass defect as well. So this increases the stability of the nucleus as it has less potential stored in its actual structure because it has less mass, which is actually why the universe tends to smaller nuclei as they contain less potential energy and therefore are more stable. Now it's important to note that the decay energy is not the radiation particle emitted. This will count as the mass afterwards. It's literally the energy of the emission as well. So if there was only mass found in the universe, we would say that the nucleus before would equal the nucleus after plus the alpha particle in this particular example. However, in reality, it's that the mass before, the nucleus before has a greater mass than the nucleus after and the alpha particle afterwards, because some of the mass before has turned into decay energy. So the true equation is actually saying that the mass energy of the nucleus before is equal to the mass of the nucleus afterwards plus the mass of the alpha particle afterwards plus the decay energy afterwards. So some of the mass before has turned into decay energy. So some of the mass has been lost to energy, so this mass change is called the mass defect. So we can calculate the amount of energy released in nuclear decays using Albert Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, which gives us the universal relationship between the potential energy stored in an object and its rest mass. So for example, if a piece of material of mass 5 kilograms could be completely converted into energy, how much energy would be released. So we would say E equals mc squared, Okay, and we can get our answer in this case to be 4.5 times 10 to the 17 joules. Now that is a colossal amount of energy, three times the amount of energy that arrives with the Earth and the Sun every second. So it indicates just how big a potential energy store mass is. But that's very, very unlikely to have all the mass of an object con change completely into energy. It's more likely a small amount of mass would change into energy. So if a piece of material of mass 5 kilograms lost 0.00030 kilograms of mass during a process, Process, how much energy would be released. So we use here the mass change in our equation, E equals mc squared, and we get our answer to be 2.7 times 10 to the 13 joules. So you always really think about, in terms of nuclear decays, the actual mass change that's taken place. Now, you'll notice in our equation, okay, that on the scale of nuclear decays, the unit of the kilogram tends to be too large. So actually, when we're looking at mass change on the nuclear scale, we don't tend to use kilograms, we use another unit, which we then convert back into kilograms when we use our equation E equals mc squared. So in many examples of nuclear decay, the mass of an atom will not be expressed in kilograms, but rather in atomic mass units. So the mass of an atom is expressed in these atomic mass units U to avoid very, very tiny fractions of kilograms being used. Now the definition of one atomic mass unit is that this equal to one twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom. Now one U is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the minus 20 27 kilograms. So here are some examples of the masses of the constituent particles of an atom okay, in these values of U. So a proton is 1.0073 U, a neutron 1.0087 U, and an electron is 5.49 times 10 to the minus 4 U. Now physicists, when they had this idea of E equals mc squared, considered the following problem. If rest mass and energy are equivalents, well then how much energy will be required to remove a nucleon from a nucleon? Now to consider these ideas we've got to work backwards because why does a, why do nuclei exist in the first place in the universe and because a nucleus is much more common than free protons or free neutrons well why is this? Well, in a nucleus, there's a strong force produced by all nucleons, which is attractive and holds the nucleus together. The protons repel each other due to electrostatic repulsions, but the nucleons come together because the strong force is larger than the electrostatic repulsion, which gives a stable nucleus. So suppose all the nucleons in a nucleus were separated from each other, removing each one from the nucleus in turn one after the other. Well, work would therefore need to be done to overcome the attractive strong nuclear force 
and separate the nucleons out from each other. So this tells us that the potential energy of each nucleon is therefore increased when we remove it from the nucleus because we're putting work in, energy into that nucleon to pull it out of the nucleus. So this stops the nucleons from collapsing back into the nucleus under this attractive strong force. So because now these nucleons, when they're removed from the nucleus, have slightly more potential energy, it means that their mass will increase slightly, E equals mc squared. But it also means that they're slightly less stable. So this means that the lower energy state is found in the nucleus, so therefore actually our nucleons have less energy whilst in the nucleus and are therefore more stable. So when the nucleus is separated into individual nucleons, the individual nucleons all gain potential energy. So this means the overall mass of nucleons separated from each other will be larger than the mass of one nucleus where they're all together. So this is another example of the mass defect which we can work out with our equation delta E equals delta MC squared, where we'll make delta M our subject. Now, conversely, when the nucleons collate to form a nucleus, they'll lose potential energy as they're more stable because they've got that attractive strong force exerted on each other. So this would mean that the combined mass of the nucleons will be larger than the mass of the nucleus that's formed. So therefore, when the nucleons combine to form the nucleus, mass is then lost and it's turned into energy energy, which follows Einstein's postulate as stated previously. So we can, this means, like we said before, that the combined mass of the nucleons is larger than the mass of the nucleus, which is the mass defect, which is calculated by delta M is equal to delta E over C squared. So let's have a look at this in a particular example. So from the definition of one atomic mass unit, one carbon nucleus has a mass of 12U. So the mass of one carbon nucleus is 12U, but if we work out the mass of six protons and six neutrons, well then the mass them individually is 12.096 U. So this tells us that the mass of a nucleus is always less than the total mass of the individual nucleons from which it's made. The difference between the mass of the nucleus and the total mass of the individual nucleons is called the mass defect of the nucleus, which we can calculate with the equation shown on the screen. Now we can calculate our mass defect in either kilograms or atomic mass units. Now in the process of nuclear fusion, nuclear fission and radioactive decay, each process produces a mass defect as the stability is increased. That's why we carry out those processes, to increase the stability of the nucleus. So this allows energy to be produced. So suppose all the nucleons in a nucleus were separated from each other. The extra energy needed for the nucleons to exist freely in the universe is the binding energy. So it's the energy required to overcome the strong force attraction in the nucleus. And the binding energy of each elementary nucleus is dependent on the size of the strong force there, which we can calculate by the equation delta E is equal to delta mc squared. So what we can say is the work that's done to separate a nucleus into all of its constituent nucleons is called the binding energy. Now the equivalent mass to this binding energy is known as the mass defect. Now we can calculate our mass defect or our binding energy with our equation binding energy is equal to mass defect times by c squared. But actually there is also a shortcut here because if the mass defect is given in u atomic mass units then the equivalent binding energy can be worked out by our following shortcut. Binding energy in MeV is equal to the mass defect in U times by 931.3. Now, this method replaces the equation delta E equals delta MC squared. So we can also rearrange that and say we can work out our mass defect in U by doing our binding energy in MeV divided by 931.3. So to clarify, the binding energy of a nucleus is defined as the energy required to separate all of the nucleons in a nucleus. This is the energy needed to provide the extra mass required for all the nucleons to exist separately. It's the energy equivalent of the mass defect. So the binding energy in joules is equal to the mass defect in kilograms times by C squared. Now it can also be useful to calculate the binding energy in MeV from the mass defect in atomic mass units, where binding energy in MeV is equal to the mass defect in units 
U times by 931.3. Because remember, 1 U is equal to 931.3 MeV. So it'll make the equation a lot easier to carry out. So let's have a look at an example of calculating the mass defect. The mass of a nucleus of potassium uh, of 40 K with a proton number of 19 is 39.9536 U and the mass of a proton is 1.00728 U and the mass of a neutron is 1.00878 U. Calculate the mass defect of the nucleus in U. Well, firstly, the first step is you've got to derive the number of protons and neutrons. So you work out your number of protons, your number of neutrons. You then determine the mass of the, the actual nucleons themselves. So you work out the mass of the protons and the mass of the neutrons in U. You then determine the mass defect of the nucleus by doing your mass defect is going to be equal or mass deficit, sorry, is equal to the mass of the nucleons minus the mass of the nucleus. So it's 40.30239U minus 39.9536U is equal to 0.36679U. Another example question might ask you to calculate the actual binding energy of the nucleus in MeV. So the mass of a nucleus of potassium 40, which has a, which has a proton number of 19, is 39.9536U. The mass of a proton is 1.0072. 8u and the mass of a neutron is 1.00867u. Calculate the binding energy of the nucleus in MeV. So like I said before, you derive your number of protons and neutrons, you determine the mass of your nucleons, you determine the mass defect of the nucleus, and then you can then determine the binding energy of the nucleus by times in your mass defect um, by um, by, by times by 931.3. So in this case, our mass defect is equal to 0 0.36679 times by 931.3 is 342 MeV. If you then wanted to, you can then convert this into joules by using the equation 1 MeV is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. Now this tends to be a faster method than using the equation delta E is equal to delta MC squared. So what, how can we learn in today's lesson? We can appreciate that E equals mc squared applies to all energy changes carry out simple calculations involving mass difference and bind energy have our atomic mass unit equal u and have our conversion of units of one u is equal to 931.3 mev so if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson we can describe the nuclear processes of releasing energy calculate the binding energy of the nuclear process and define and describe the concept of binding energy so i hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on binding energy which is part the nuclear physics topic in AQAA level physics. Thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day.